in second Peter. Introduction before my thing. Okay. Okay. All right. So after Donald lights and um, whomever reads the first reading, then I come up. Okay. Two candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light banish darkness. He shall feed the flock like a shepherd, gently leading them home. Good morning, church. In our Advent series, we're celebrating the gift of being truly present to each other and to the call of God and to make this world a better place. We can be the gift of presence with those who are experiencing life as less than peaceful. But this might also be true of how we are personally feeling at this moment. Our lives can feel a bit chaotic or in need of a makeover. How many needs a makeover? this holiday season. There we go. The good news is that God is continually making a way for do-overs. In this we can find peace even when life doesn't feel so peaceful. And so this week our focus is on what it means to be a gift of non-anxious presence for those most in need of it. And we're going to sing this song for you. What can I give him? 
and we encourage you to sing along. are going to light our key peace candle for us. Our Everybody just back up. We unwrap a present on the second Sunday of Advent with great anticipation for the gift that God will reveal. We open our hearts as we open the gift. Okay, here. The promise of peace is the divine gift we receive. And what will we do with it? The gift of Christ's peace reminds us that we can serenity even in the midst of non-peaceful situations. Peace is not simply the absence of conflict. Peace is an ever-present gift that we can open at any time. When we stop, breathe, and trust that we are never alone, and the gift of peace we can give is to be present for those who feel alone. We light this candle of peace as a sign that we will be present with peace in the world. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a Good morning, church. Good morning. It's wonderful to see all of you this uh, second morning of Advent. Um, so I'm going to say a prayer of presence. Let us pray. Holy living light of God, you are our peaceful presence. Let this peace grow in our lives each day so we can be a presence of peace to others. Unwrap and open our hearts. May it be so. Amen. Thank you. Please rise for our opening hymn. Number 373, O Day of Peace.
O oh, day of peace that dimly shines Through all our hopes and prayers and dreams Guide us to justice, truth, and love Delivered from our selfish schemes May swords of hate fall from our hands Our hearts from envy find release Till by God's grace our warring world We'll see Christ's promised reign of peace. O Tim shall roll well with the Lamb, nor shall the fierce devour the small. As beasts and cattle kindly graze, a little child shall lead them all. Then enemies shall learn to love, all creatures find their true accord. The hope of peace shall be fulfilled, for all the earth shall know the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. How we doing? We made it to the chapel. Always a good thing, and uh, uh, we are a people of extravagant welcome, and we love to say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. As we prepare for our land acknowledgement, I have a short video to learn more about the indigenous peoples between northern Washington and southeast Alaska, and we'll learn a little bit more about these people today. and sometimes have this idea that it's untouched by man, that it's wilderness, but the reality is that people have lived in among these forests and in tune with them for such a long time. The Emerald Edge is the largest intact coastal temperate rainforest remaining in the world. It is a hundred million acre band of living forest and ocean stretching from Washington State through Canada's coastal British Columbia to Southeast Alaska. You can see the region's name reflected in the color of its 30,000 miles of coastline and 800 year old forests. Here the mosaic of land and water is a treasure unlike anything else in the world. Over 35 indigenous communities have cared for and depended on this rainforest for millennia. The Cleoquot Sound region is home to the Tlo'okoyet, Ahauzit, and Heshkwit First Nations. Sun Kamartin of the Tlo'okoyet First Nation is a musician, entrepreneur, and activist. She guides visitors through the waters and helps them better understand how Tlo'okoyet people relate to the environment. Her music raises awareness about the issues impacting her ancestral lands. My revolution means that none of us are free to live like our ancestors, how life used to be. If you look into the picture, forensically, you may be deeply disturbed internally and feel your own response, ability. Um, the first non-native peoples that came here and settled were all about colonizing with the mentality that it's endless, that there's always going to be more, there's always going to be a next place to go. But for us, this is home. We actually kind of want to get away from the idea of just the use and the idea of resource and benefits and more in touch with the idea of, or the reality of relationships with everything that is here. That's part of that first teaching of Esau, respect for all life. For centuries after colonization began, First Nation people were stripped of their right to self-govern or even vote. Without First Nation stewardship, the land, wildlife, and livelihood of local communities was endangered. Simka's father, Joe Martin, an elder and longtime activist of the Tlokoyet First Nation, is helping to preserve the identity and culture of his people through the tradition of canoe carving. Canoe was one of the most important creations of the coastal peoples here because it gave us access to all of the resources. 
the process of selecting a, a tree for a canoe was one of the most important steps. And that was because of the teachings of our people to be very respectful of all the creatures around here. I had to come here several times and sit here and just listen to be really quiet. Make sure that there's no eagle nests around in any of the trees here. There'll be five canoes made out of this one tree. And we'll learn more about them next week. Sunday at 2 p.m. Did you want to say anything about that? Yes, the Corral will um, continue its tradition of providing a holiday concert uh, featuring um, what is commonly referred to as the Christmas Spiritual. So if you've not heard the Christmas Spirituals, uh, those spirituals in the African American tradition um, about the birth of a child, um, it would be a treat um, for to, to come and listen to that. Um, and you're all invited, 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, the, uh, December 17th. Hope to see you there. And it's at First Presbyterian Church First, of Oakland on First Grand Press. Avenue. Yes, 27th and Broadway. Broadway, gotcha. All right, we have birthdays. Donald Lang, Melissa Paniagua, Jacob Brown, and Tom and Nancy Cundiff's anniversary. Let's happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday everybody, happy birthday to you, and many more. Our Wednesday social hour is on Zoom, it's a way to check in with the church at home, and it just keeps trying to go past it, but the Advent party is on Zoom tonight at 4 o'clock. And um, it'll probably be about an hour. Is that about right? And there will be some music, and there will be a craft, and I, maybe, a, maybe a craft. Debbie's not here today. Um, her father is doing a little bit better and is back at home. So that's some, the good news. But it'll be on Zoom this afternoon, and we'll be sharing some of our uh, different Advent um, traditions. Tradition. Tradition. We love our traditions, yes. And um, uh, the Holy Roller Coaster Progressive Bible Study will continue January 31st. If you have any questions about that, you can talk to me. And uh, our next book study, we're going to start Tuesday, January 9th. This book called Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution by Rain Wilson, who plays Dwight on The Office, and that's where you might have seen him from. But he's a progressive Baha'i. <coughs> that uh, thinks a little bit about spirituality, too. So we're grateful to be able to do that. Donald, please lead us on with the lighting of the peace candle. So as now, we are lighting the peace candle. Across the distance, the light from within me shines, sending love to all across the distance. Your light is fuel that warms me and helps to keep my own light burning. Together, we keep the flame of community burning bright. Amen.
So what usually happens is, you know, somebody who does Peace Candle um, or whoever uh, shares a um, remembering the story of our ancestors. Um, it was a couple of years ago that my aunt, my Aunt May, um, shared with me a little bit more of the story of our family history. Um, our family on um, this side um, hails from Louisiana. And um, during the times of slavery, um, they've had to travel back and forth and um, they've struggled a lot um, from being freed, being sold, whatever was happening at that time, it was definitely a story of survival and resilience. And growing up in my life, um, in many family members, um, resonates with everyone within our family, um, even with me. As most of you know, um, my testimony, I grew up with a lot of dysfunction and a lot of just disarray at times. It wasn't healthy. But the one thing that I carry with me is that whole, this whole thing called resilience and survival. Amen. And that is the one gift that I am, that I never thought I would say that I'm grateful for, but I'm saying it today. I survived a lot. And even in the midst of surviving an autoimmune disorder. I had my infusion last week, one of many infusions that I take. Um, and hopefully, God willing, if I get married and I have children of my own, they will know my story of resilience and survival. One, so that I will hope, they will hopefully won't know what it's like, not to say that they won't go through pain, but hopefully when they listen to my story, whatever they go through in their path, it will be embedded in them too, and generations and generations to come. Good morning, church. Good morning. This is a time when we pour libations to the ancestors, and I'm particularly struck by uh, what Donald read this morning, um, the passage starting with, Across the distance, the light from within me shines, sending love to all. Um, this uh, passage makes me think of our ancestors um, in the distance whose light continues to shine on us as we worship today um, without water. Um, so, no, that's okay. That's all right. So you know what water is. And you, this, it's okay. It's all right. This is the ritual pouring of water on the earth which is the act of libation. So this morning, as we pour the libation and we call out the names of our ancestors, those who are off in the distance, whose light continues to shine on us, let us lift them up either in our voices or in our hearts. Amen. 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 
William and Candace Dennis. Gracious and loving God, we pour our hearts out to you today as we pour the waters of libation. We reach out into that distance where the light from our ancestors continues to shine on us. Let them be with us today as we find ourselves in worship, singing to your glory, in remembrance of that son born so long ago who brought new life, new hope, and new joy into the world. And let the people of God say, Amen. 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 Well, Donald comes over to the lectern. Uh, I saw Debbie came in. Debbie, we'd already done announcements. Do you have any craft for tonight's Advent party? All right, so anyone that wants to do a craft can see Debbie after the service and you can get the craft to be able to do online on Zoom. And the, the Zoom link is out there on the emails. But will it go out one more time before 4 o'clock tonight? Went out yesterday. Went out yesterday, so look in your email. And Donald, come on over and lead us in the passing of the peace. The energy that flows through Jesus to us is an, act, is an active peace of Christ. As you reach out, may this peace of Christ be with you. Let us offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. So the first reading will be from Isaiah 40, uh, 1 to 11, and 2 Peter 3, 8 to 15a. The prophet Isaiah lived in a time of exile perpetrated on the Hebrews by the Babylonians. By the time we get to get to chapter 40, one of our readings today, Isaiah's disciples are writing after the exile has ended. In this part of the book, we hear themes of comfort and peace and the possibility that the paths of our lives can be cleared for new life. We also hear that we are always held in the peaceful presence of our God let us read these excerpts responsively. Console my people, give them comfort, says your God. A voice cries out, clear a path through the wilderness for Yahweh make a straight road through the desert for our God. Let every valley be built in, every mountain and hill be laid low. Let every cliff become a plain, and the ridges become a Go up on a high mountain, you who bring good news to Zion. Shout with a loud voice, you who bring good news to Jerusalem. Shout without fear, and say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. My shepherd, you feed your flock, gathering the lambs and holding them close, and leading the brother to you with gentleness. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm reading from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. The new churches of this first century church were encouraged by the writer of the letters called 1 and 2 Peter. These churches were living in a confusing time as they struggled with the belief that Jesus' return was imminent, but was not yet coming to fruition. In our reading today, the writer invites them to wait with peaceful hearts, even in the midst of what feels like chaos. Hear this excerpt from the second letter of Peter. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of people ought we to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire? But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Come on now. So also, our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. Just want to give thanks to the jubilation singers under the leadership of our esteemed Steve Rhodes for providing this music to us. Um, This is an arrangement of a piece that we've done before, uh, but the piece before was um, a simple arrangement, mainly the refrain. This morning, uh, we're singing the Michael Frazier arrangement of Jesus What a wonderful child. He 
was heralded by the angels, born in an only manger. The Virgin Mary was his mother, and Joseph was his earthly father. The wise men came from afar, they were guided by a shining star to see King Jesus where he lay in a manger filled with hay. Amen. Yeah. And just to let you know, um, I am in full recovery from being under the weather, so I am definitely have recovered for this moment. So, <laughs> all right. So this next reading is Mark chapter one, verses one through eight. The second gospel reading of Advent from the gospel according to Mark is the very beginning of the book, setting up the idea that this story of Jesus will be a transformative experience. Drawing on the prophet Isaiah, Mark tells his readers that God is making a way in the most difficult places, clearing open paths in the desert places. Amen? John the Baptist shows up in Advent as he typically does a sign that the time has come when the Messiah, born of the Spirit, will be present among us. Here begins the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I send my message before you to prepare your way, a herald's voice in the desert crying, Make ready the way of our God, clear a straight path. And so John the, Bap the baptizer appeared in the desert, proclaiming baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to John and were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. He ate nothing but 
grasshoppers, and wild honey. In the course of his preaching, John said, one more powerful than I, one more powerful than I is to come after me. And I'm not fit to stoop and, you, and untie his sandal straps. I have baptized you in water, but the one to come will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God. God. All creation is a word of God. God. If you allow me just a moment, I'd like to step back to the second reading. It's a little bit different version. It's in the bulletin. But I feel that in the spirit it bears reiterating. This point, Peter says, must not be overlooked, dear friends. In the eyes of the Most High, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. God does not delay in keeping the promises, or keeping the promises, some mean delay. Rather, God shows us generous patience. Somebody say generous Generous. patience, desiring that no one perish, but that all come to repentance. But what what we await are new heavens and a new earth where, according to According to the promise, God's justice will reside. So, beloved, while waiting for this, make every effort to be found at peace. Do we do that? Make every effort to be found at peace and without stain or defilement in God's sight. Consider our God's patience as your opportunity for salvation. The prompting today, the sermon title for today, is The Pursuit of Holiness. Are we there yet? (laughs) We are trying, aren't we? We are trying and we are trying. Yes. So this Sunday, we celebrate the gift of being present. Presence is not just about being somewhere. It's being active in something. To those on the outside of the church walls, it may seem as if the church in this season of Advent has taken a flight from reality. In this season of Advent, we should experience it as more than just a flight from reality of current times. Advent is more than just singing about angels in the sky, even though the singing has been wonderful today. It's more than the story of a virgin feeding her baby in a cattle trough, and more than a cataclysmic global barbecue at the end of time and Jesus returning. We hear all those things during this season. And yet, Why do you think we have to hear it over and over and over again? May we pray that the birth of Jesus this year truly make a change for us. So I don't say any of that because I believe that we should dismiss the season of Advent. In the season of Advent, we have two foci. One is Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. We heard it in the uh, earlier. One 2,000 years ago, and the other is the end of space and time as we know it. However, rather than worrying about the lives of people 2,500 years ago or wondering what people 2,500 years in the future will think, what about the church today? If you've come to the cross of Christ, it's time to make things right. Now is the accepted time to repent. Today is the day 
of salvation. Today is the day to set our hearts and minds on things above. It's not time to gossip. It's not time to be judgmental. It's not time to refrain from embracing. It is, in fact, time to embrace. Embrace those you love and those you need to love. Embrace those who are dying before even getting an opportunity to recenter their lives. Today is the day that each of us should ask ourselves where we are spiritually as a church that has obtained a faith of equal standing of what we have been given by belief. Today is the day that we as a church in 2023 asks ourselves if we are operating with the conviction of what God's righteousness grants. Do we understand that Conviction about God and Christ's righteousness is not simply a collection of ideas about the character of God and Christ. Amen. If in fact we as a community were living with the conviction of God's righteousness, we would understand without a shadow of a doubt that we already have everything that's needed for us to achieve justice for all believers. We've already got it. We've got each other. That's what God placed us here for, amen? amen? So we've already got it. If in fact we as a community were living with the conviction of God's righteousness without a shadow of a doubt, then we would already know that we're partakers of the divine nature of God. How do you think we keep existing? <laughs> we would know that we can expect to become like God and have life and godliness at the same time. I know it's a hard pill for me to swallow too. Because sometimes, sometimes I know that I am acting ungodly. And yet I find trouble. <laughs> Ooh but for the grace of God, amen? amen? He does not destroy us for our mistakes. Amen. Amen. In the pursuit of holiness, Christians in 2023 must do more than tiptoe around waiting for something to happen. We must stop waiting for God to intervene waiting for God, the God who we know to be so real and to be so significant for our lives to break into the world and make God's self known to us. Uh, aren't we already at this point supposed to know? We must be motivated to action with the authority we've been given to wipe out that which is evil and to establish God's rule, it's time. God's rule of peace and righteousness where what is right conquers what is evil. Are we there yet? Faith in God and Christ's righteousness means that what is evil will not last. It cannot last. The righteousness of God and Christ means that all that opposes the pure goodness of God and Christ has a limited shelf life. We see it in the unraveling of our democracy. We see it in the senseless war between two factions of people that are basically related. Faith in God and Christ's righteousness means that it won't last and it cannot last. Everything that opposes God's righteousness will be destroyed. You can count on it. Amen. The blessing is we get to watch it. Yes, it's heartbreaking. Yes, it's frightening. But we get to bear witness. The reason we get to bear witness is so that we can tell the next generation. And the story goes on and on. Are we there yet? Does the church of the 21st century understand that in order for the righteousness of God and Christ to be all in all, what is now must come to an end? That's even in the church. 
If Peter was certain then that the present heavens and the earth must be destroyed in order for the purity of the divine nature to fill creation, I'm duly convinced today of the same thing. If Peter was convinced then that there would be a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, then are we there yet? He or she or they that have an ear. We are not justified by faith with an option to sign up for the additional holiness package. Rather, we are justified by faith in order that we might have access to a transformative relationship with a holy God. Wasn't it Jesus who said, these things I do, but greater things will you do? I thought I read that somewhere. Weren't we as the church commissioned to wipe out that which is evil and to establish God's rule of peace and righteousness where what is right conquers what is evil? We spend so much of our time on uh, time and money on building up our comfort zones and our walls and our defense systems and our image that it seems we've lost sight of what holiness really is. One day, either when we die or when Jesus returns, it will all be stripped away from us. Count on it. On that day, it will be a face-to-face -face encounter, a one a one-to-one -one with the Son of God. Are you ready <laughs> to have that conversation? I imagine and liken it to me as a child wanting to be able to sit down and talk to Michael Jackson. <laughs> and how intense that might have been. You understand? On that day, it's going to be a one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, -face with the Son of God. If something has got a strong hold on you, then you better be willing to let it go. Because it's going to be stripped away from you anyway. We need to begin to face up to who we are, who we really are now. Are we there yet? Holiness is a murky word for some. The Bible uses words like holy more than words like love. Yet holiness being a murky word, it evokes several ideas. First, when something is holy, hallelujah, I love sound confirmations, it belongs to God. Sacrifices were holy because they were God's food. They were meals shared between God and the people making the offering. People were holy when they acted like they belonged to God. Second, when something is holy, it's complete. It has integrity. It's darn near perfect. It belongs to God, and God wants the very best for that thing, person, tree. God enjoys the times when we're alert and full of life, not the glassy-eyed moments when we feel compelled to check out on life yet again. Third, when something's holy, it's beautiful. God told me I was beautiful this week. Amen? Amen. Amen. When something is holy, it's beautiful. No matter what it may smell like, look like, who it may sleep with, or how it may define itself, we are beautiful to God because God is beautiful. God is greater than we ever could be. God and God alone is the only thing that's worthy of our worship. Fourth, I didn't tell you there were five things, I just said a few things. <laughs> Fourth, when something's holy, it's pure. People today associate purity with sexual things, such as who's sleeping with who, but biblical purity included daily matters like cleanliness and food. Have you bathed today? Have you eaten today? 
Do you know that personal hygiene was a sacrament? They cleansed themselves before going to the temple as a reminder that God is pure and good. They just didn't show up any old kind of way. I know it says, whosoever will come, come as you are. I get it. I got that. Right? But there was a standard. <laughs> even, there is a standard even in that. Yes? Okay. So they cleanse themselves as a reminder that God is pure and good and different from everyday clutter, dirt, and disease. Lastly, when something's holy, it's set apart. It means it's lonely. John was in the wilderness, yes? A raven maniac eating grasshoppers and honey. <laughs> Running around in camel hair. <laughs> but he was holy. <laughs> he was doing holy work, right? So we're set apart. And while most of us aren't tempted to bow down before literal idols, we make idols out of the things we cherish, don't we? Have we forgotten that we are called to work against the rampant forces of greed, lust, gluttony, and violence in our day? I'm asking, has the church forgotten? Why? Because as Second Peter puts it, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Peter wrote this text to believers that had two interrelated problems. They doubt the coming of Christ, and they are drawn to immoral living. Whatever that is, it wasn't good. He wrote this text to motivate people toward action now, to create a sense of urgency in bringing people closer to Jesus. We are getting closer and closer to that return. We just don't know when it's going to be. I wish people would stop forecasting the doom yet not telling people how to survive. <clears throat> so there's an urgency. It's hard to find people today who are even aware of holiness in this sense, much less people who order their lives around it. Are we there yet? Peter's not attempting to provide a cosmological map of the end times in this text. He's using just contemporary contextual, cataclysmic language to talk about the reality and severity of judgment and the necessary pursuit of holiness for Christians. Despite all the cosmic language, though, in this text, the desire of God is clear. See, there's hope. Namely, God wants all to reach repentance before the day of judgment. God desires the salvation of all people. That, what is salvation? Simply coming to the knowledge of the truth. The talk of the heavens passing away with a roar and the elements burning and dissolving are for the purpose of discussing not cosmology, but sanctification. That's being set apart. Are we there yet? Are we as a church set apart which is the meaning of sanctification from the world, or have we become an extension of the world? When the elements are dissolved, that which is revealed is not something biological or geological, it's something moral. Namely, the works that are done on this earth proves the type of people we are in regard to holiness and godliness. Peter's focus is not on the negative here. But on the positive, the good news is that the righteousness of God and Christ will one day be all there is. One day there will be no evil. One day there will only be the divine nature. One day there will only be love. I'll say it again. In order for the righteousness of God and Christ to be all in all, what is now must come to an end, an end to the notions of supremacy, an end to racism, an end to bigotry, 
an end to heteropatriarchy, an end to wars and strife, and an end to not caring for the least of these in this land. Understand that God's schedule is motivated by love, everyone. God is not lazy. He has got more important things to do. Verse 9b says, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Therefore, God knows who God wishes to spend eternity with. And, and nobody on this earth that can tell you that God does not want to spend eternity with you. God knows. That's why God waited for you and me to be conceived. That's why God waited for you and me to turn to God, to turn back to God if we ever got lost. Maybe that is why God is still waiting, waiting for you and me to put aside our stubborn pride, intellectual arrogance, and willful selfishness, and admit that God is God. This is not a flight from reality. This is a passage of utter realism. It's about the future and our hope for the future. But because it's about the future, the future as it will be, it's also about the present. We're talking about the present, our presence in the present. What was the present today? Peace. That was the present inside the present. Hmm. It's about how you and I live here and now, trusting the promises of God living spotless and blameless lives and being at peace with God and each other. The pursuit of holiness. Are we there yet? Amen. Amen. Amen.
Can we thank Michael for drawing that out of us again? Sometimes we don't realize what's in us as a choir until he draws it out of us. Our prayer families this week are Chuck and Merdell Dibdahl, Bob Ewan and Don Monk Ewan, College Avenue Presbyterian Church, where my friend Monty McLean serves, and Congregational Church UCC in Elk Grove. Are there joys and concerns that we would like to share? And let's uh, check in with the church at home first and see if there's uh, any prayers that you would like to share there, and then we'll open it up to the folks here in church. Hello. Nothing. Not hearing. Nothing. I heard you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear us? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, we have a couple of joys. The first joy is we're great grandparents. We had a great grandson born by the name of Asher on Thursday. He was born a month early, weighing five pounds eight ounces and 18 inches long we're thrilled and we're going to go meet him next week so that's that's number one number two is i had the mri of my brain because my oncologist wanted to check see if i had cancer in my brain and fortunately it came back on saturday and it was negative for metastases in my brain however I still wonder why I continue to forget about stuff. An age thing. You know, so, so at any rate, I don't have cancer in my brain. Okay, they have two joys. They ha are great, great grandparents or grandparents? Great grandparents. Great grandparents. Great grandparents of a boy named Asher that was born this week, five pounds, eight ounces, and they're going to see him next week. Um, also, secondly, Bill got results of his MRI, his brain scan, and there's no cancer or problem in the brain. He says he wonders why he's still forgetful. <laughs> and Bob says it's an age thing. <laughs> Lord, in your grace, you hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Uh, whoop. Anyone else? I'm not seeing any other hands. Uh, we have Murdell, Anne, Ken Schmidt, uh, Dexheimers, uh, Tom Cundiff, Briandi, and um, let's see, a name I'm not familiar with. I'll have to look again. Pat Mims. All right. Great to see Pat Mims. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, I have a couple, or a joy. Um, yesterday, Karen and I had an opportunity of meeting and holding our youngest or newest grandson named Miles Reed. He was born cesarean on Friday evening. Uh, he's uh, eight pounds, 12 ounces, and is 20 inches long. He's doing great. He looks beautiful, but his mom is in a lot of pain, Shelby, and she's uh, I, when we saw her, she was really very painful. The other thing is my second son, Scott, is still in uh, ICU in uh, Santa Clara, Kaiser. Uh, the doctors really don't know exactly what's wrong with him. He, 
Um, they've got his temperature down. He was up to 103.7 most of the, but then they got it down. But there's a di disagreement between the, the doctors because some think he has what's called um, valley fever. Mm. And I'm not really familiar with that. And the other, and so they've been taking uh, parts out of his lungs to figure out what it is. They they sent the the test to Davis, UC Davis, because that's I guess the custodian of all, um, or the information about Valley Fever. But they haven't responded yet. So um, Scott's he's he has good days, but not good days. So uh, I wish it, you know prayers for him. And part of his family now has COVID, so they can't even visit him. Mm. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. I'll come back over to you, Joe. I have a, actually one of each. Um, our little grandson, Wes, who was born about a year and a half ago, has been officially diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Mm. Um, he can't sit up yet. Um, it's going to be a long road for them. So lots of prayers. Lord, in your mercy. On a good note, um, session approved me last week of putting a sidewalk in along the church here. And I met with a guy for about an hour and a half on Saturday. Um, it's going to be complicated, but weather permitting, he thinks he might possibly have it in before Christmas Eve. Yay. Lord, in your mercy. That gives us something to pray for, too, right there, right? Um, I have a joy. Um, my father um, is out of the hospital, and... Um, they found out that he had an infection in his intestines is what was causing all the bleeding, which none of us expected that. Um, so they pumped him up with a lot of medications and antibiotics, especially for that. He was highly contagious. None of us knew that while we were visiting. <laughs> so, um, but all of us are all well. All of us have not had any um, symptoms or anything so we're all good um, but my dad is home um, the medication made him rather confused um, couldn't use words he was having very much difficulty but he's doing well now he's back to his old jokester and so um, I thank you all for your prayers for my dad Lord in your mercy My joy is for my daughter, Allison. She, um, her movie was uh, shown last night at uh, Martinez uh, Cinema and it turned out great. It's a no budget um, movie. It's all um, from her money, um, her own money. So she encouraged a lot of her coworker to be actors and um, families, and it turned out great. I was really proud of her. Lord, in your grace. Donna Henry is asking for prayers from her church family. Um, some of you may know that she was diagnosed a few years ago with an aortic aneurysm and she's been having it watched very closely by cardiologists in Newport Beach. Um, she's down, the, well, they're on their way home right now, but uh, she had some testing this week, and there was a, a bit of a change in the size of the aneurysm, so the cardiologist is strongly recommending um, surgery. It's a very serious surgery. It's open, open heart surgery. Uh, the date hasn't been decided yet, but it will be January, February, so it's coming up. This is life-changing. Um, Janie and I have been talking with Donna since she got the test of her results, and she's coping with it. It's, 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 it's big. Um, so our caregiver, Donna, 
for those of you who listened to her story about her work as a volunteer chaplain, um, now needs for us to be the caregivers and listen to her, um, help her get through this just this new life that she's going to be experiencing. Uh, she will likely, when she has a surgery, have to stay down there in Newport Beach for about a month, um, and then her recovery time later at home. So, wrap her in your prayers, and um, we trust that all will be well. Lord, in your mercy. All right, so um, my, I am going to be going to see my sister in Sacramento, and that's for during the holiday season. Uh, pray that I'll have a safe trip there and back. And also, um, just for the season of Christmas, it's kind of the long stretch for me, um, just for that whole holiday in general, just mentally and financially and everything else. So, lots of prayers. Lord, in your grace. Uh, the latest I've heard on Pastor Christy is the tumor was removed from her cheek. That's where the, the cancer was. They think they got it all, but she won't have a definitive response to that until tomorrow when the results from the biopsy are back. But she says she's, it's uncomfortable, but she's doing well, and she is responding and her daughter, uh, well, with both her kids, but now her daughter is taking good care of her with, as she says, lots of smoothies and pureed soups. So um, she has a good outlook, and let's keep her in our prayers as well. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for Janice Campbell as well. Lord, in your grace. And prayers for Sherry uh, Van Pelt. She lost her husband, Rudy. He was only 61. Rudy was this amazing extremely healthy, lean man, so kind. Um, and he always ran for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And then he got some cancer and he had to leave. But he did say to Sherry, as she was laying on his chest and he was in his hospital bed, he said, I can see heaven and it's beautiful. And he's the uncle of my middle um, bonus daughter, daughter-in-law. Lord, in your grace. We're moving into our prayer time, and we're going to sing right here, right now. and find ourselves multitasking or obsessing about something that isn't quite right or settled or the particular way we like it. We're very accustomed to a preoccupied mind that often has little peace. In this season, we will give ourselves a respite from this pace as we slow down in this prayer time, taking on a more peaceful rhythm. We will begin our prayers with three questions, each followed by a short silence, focusing intently on thoughts and memories that can be a kind of prayer, bringing our lives into a conversation with the holy. I invite you to put your feet on the floor and take a deep breath and close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. Our first question, of course, is, who was a gift of presence to you this week? 
Did you experience their attention in a way that felt like a special connection? Take a moment to recall this in your mind's eye. See it emerge like opening a gift. If you cannot recall such a moment, that's okay. This week you'll notice these moments more deeply. Our second question is, how did you offer yourself as a gift of presence? What did it feel like to extend your attentiveness and availability beyond yourself? Did you notice how it made a difference to someone else for you to be truly present to them? Our third question, is it possible that God's presence is felt more acutely in these moments when we truly tend to one another? What could you do this coming week that would allow God's gift of peace to flow through you to someone else? It may be as simple as finding opportunities to speak an encouraging word or as complex as actually lifting up someone's circumstances through volunteering or donating. prayerful present moment, we train our attention on those who are in distress. Again, we need reminding as the leaves fall and the temperatures drop, the one who we need is preparing once more for a visitation in a most unusual form, in the most perfect way. The child is coming, the one who will change everything. The world near his birthplace is on fire, on fire with intolerance, misunderstanding. Where violence reigns supreme and the children are dying, they cry out for help. We cry out for help. The child is coming, the one who will change everything. So we pray for hope, for a king who will save us all, save us from ourselves, from our unnatural deaths, and bring us to eternal life through one more sacrifice of love and surrender. This week, we also pray in this present moment, training our attention on thanksgiving and joy. What can we give thanks and joy for this week? The child is coming, the one who will change everything, the one who knows your needs, who will heal where there was pain and brokenness, for he is the peacemaker, the lamb, the shepherd, the king. The child is coming who will change everything. The word will be made flesh for us all to consume as he becomes one with us in human form, perfectly form, perfectly divine. Yes, the child is coming, the one who will change everything. Let us prepare the way, let us prepare ourselves, let us prepare the world for peace. 
And so in this prayerful present moment, we ask you, Christ Jesus, the greatest gift of all, to help us savor our journey towards the celebration of Christmas. Help us recognize and create moments of sweet presence rather than filling the voids with the things that do not last. Help us to stop, notice what we are experiencing, and accept it with open hearts and minds. In doing this, we allow you to meet us in the right here, the right now, right where we are. Amen. Amen. say the Lord's Prayer together. Our parent who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. During this time of hybrid worship, as we cannot pass the plates to offer our gifts, place, please place your offerings in the plate up on the table here during our offertory or closing hymn. Or you can pass, or you can place your offerings in the plates in the back table on your way out. If you cannot give in person, we ask that you send all of your offerings online or by mail to Merdell Dibal, whose address is on our announcements and eat last. Thank you. Child and yet a king born. 
By your hand, O oh God, we have been blessed with life, with food, with refreshment, with hope. Day by day, you are serving us, healing our brokenness, calling forth our gifts, granting us strength to serve with Christ as part of your revelation to the world. Thank you, God, for each new opportunity to experience new life. Thank you for this day of celebration. We dedicate ourselves anew with our offering. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So we close our service with a Christmas carol. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow knew the chaos and sorrow of life, sinking into a depression after his wife died and his son was badly injured in the Civil War. When Longfellow heard the bells on Christmas Day, he was encouraged that peace could come again one day to a troubled nation. And we carry that same hope for peace today. Amen. send each other forth with these words as we strip, as we strip away, away the cluttered the surface of our lives and become, and become more, more present to the moment, moment. We, we may be disturbed, disturbed by what we can now see in the open vista, vista especially the suffering of the least of these. We are no longer numb to the cries of those hurting. We ache for the violence humans do to one another and to the earth. We, we see all people and all creation held within God's, God's love and life. Our, our comfortable lives are disrupted as we ask new, hard questions. But being more mindfully present will also bring greater awareness of God's presence, peace, and clarity in the midst of it all. So now, go 
and be truly present so you may be a gift of presence for others. That's all that is expected, that the gift that is you is the best gift you can give. In the name of the Holy Presence, the divine gift, and the spirit of peace that is just waiting for us to un Comfort, comfort now, my people. Tell the peace so says our God. Comfort those who sit in darkness, mourning under sorrow's load. To my people now proclaim that my pardon waits for them. Tell them that their sins I cover and their warfare now is over. Verse 3. Straight shall be what long was crooked and the rougher places plain. Let your hearts be true and humble as befits God's holy reign for the glory of the Lord now on earth is shed abroad and all flesh shall see the token that God's word is never broken fellowship is in the stoneman room today Please join us over there.